Hi, I'm Dr. Malescu. I am adjunct professor teaching anatomy and physiology lab as well as human biology at the Daytona State College DeLand campus. This video is going to highlight the microanatomy of muscle and also understanding the neuron structure uh, that's affiliated with innervating the muscle. Um, I will also detail the events leading to muscle contraction initiated by a motor neuron. So first I'm going to go over the models that are in our anatomy lab, uh, which you will have to identify structures for your final practical. So we will go over the two models and then I'm going to turn this video around to the PowerPoint slide that shows um, the neuromuscular junction. And we're going to detail the highlights uh, of muscle contraction. So there's three main phases. The first phase is events at the neuromuscular junction. The second phase is excitation contraction coupling. And then the last third phase is the cross bridge cycle. All of these have several steps within those three phases. So we will highlight those. But first, without further ado, let's go over uh, the models that we have here. I wanted to show you first what a neuron looks like. So um, that is what's going to help uh, contract your muscles. Um, so this here is a model of what a neuron looks like. So let's pretend this is a motor neuron because motor neurons are the specific uh, neurons that uh, innervate the muscle for contraction. So we have the soma is the cell body and there's the nucleus. The long arm that goes away and that's the extension right here. This is called the axon. Let me move the video a little bit this way because the PowerPoint slide, the light is too bright. So this is called the axon. And what you see here is the long arm extension over here. So the axon is an extension from the neuron and it sends the action potential, the nerve impulse away from the motor neuron and on its way to the muscle fiber to create uh, muscle contraction. Now, we also have these uh, satellite extensions and these are called dendrites right here. So dendrites receive um, the nerve impulse, the depolarization, the action potential, which is basically an electrochemical event that is received from a, another neuron. So some other neuron, it could be an interneuron in the CNS, brain and spinal cord, that is sending the message for this motor neuron to fire, to depolarize and send that action potential down the line. What is an action potential? Well, it's a nerve impulse. Our resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts. We can measure that. Along the way, along the way of the axon, we have um, these ion channels. And these ion channels are voltage gated. So they are going to react to a change in voltage. How does that even happen? Well, as the action pot uh, potential travels down the axon, it causes a depolarization event along the axon in which the resting membrane potential of negative 70 changes to a threshold value. That threshold value is negative 55 millivolts. In order for that to happen, the ion channels need to open up and sodium rushes in and that causes the membrane of that axon to become less negative. In other words, from a negative 70 to a threshold of positive 55. I'm sorry, uh, negative 55. From that negative 55, it can reach all the way up to positive 40. That's the peak of the action potential. And then the sodium channels close, potassium channels open, and now the potassium diffuses back in and causes again that resting membrane potential of negative 70, but not before going below that and dipping to negative 90 millivolts and then coming back to our resting membrane potential of negative 70. That's a lot of detail, but a lot of people don't understand what does it entail to have a nerve impulse. It's an electrochemical event in which you have 
the electrolytes, sodium, potassium, the sodium, potassium pump, three to two ratio, three sodiums leave, two potassiums come in. That membrane potential change is what is the nerve impulse, the action potential traveling along the axon. Now, in addition to that, we have these gaps here. See, so the gaps are the locations where there is no myelin sheath. So this here, this here structure is called the myelin sheath. And think of it as a um, insulation for the axon. And it wraps and wraps and wraps around um, like, like a, a sandwich wrap, right? And what it does is it's going to create a faster, it's going to generate a faster impulse because the uh, action potential is tra traveling along the gaps. And those gaps are called nodes of Ranvier. Okay, so the gaps are nodes of Ranvier and the nerve impulse travels along the nodes of R Ranvier via what we call saltatory, because salt means to jump, so from gymnastics to somersault. So saltatory conduction, hopping along, skipping um, to the nodes, and just skipping that whole section of the axon. So it's like jumping off three steps instead of taking each step one at a time. It takes a slower amount of time to get to the bottom of the staircase. But if you're jumping three steps at a time, you're going to get to the bottom of the staircase faster. So why is this relevant and why am I even discussing it? Well, it is relevant. For example, there are diseases like MS in which we have demyelinating disease. So the action potential travels a lot slower and we can't carry the nerve impulse as fast as we normally do. So that's all about what an action potential is. And I'm going to discuss why it's important when uh, we go over the steps to muscle contraction. All right, so now the next thing I wanna go over is uh, besides the fact that we went over the uh, nucleus, just to make sure here that we have everything on this uh, particular model. We also have these little structures here. I'm gonna bring it real close so you can see. So it kind of looks like it has the extension of the axon. It looks like a little button. So these are called the axon terminals right there. Axon terminals of other axons coming from other uh, neurons. And um, so this particular motor neuron is, is really um, receiving quite a few uh, action potentials possibly from other neurons with other axons. All right, so let's pretend that one magical <laughs> uh, neuron, let's say it's an interneuron in the spinal cord, okay, it received the message from an afferent sensory neuron. All right, the sensory neuron is for sensation, right? So let's say you stepped on a nail, okay, the sensory neuron is an afferent neuron, incoming neuron, into the spinal cord. There's thousands of them, but let's pretend we were just talking about one. And it gets to the spinal cord, and in the spinal cord, in that gray matter, we have an interneuron that processes it. So it's like you have incoming male and then outgoing male. So post office processes the information and sends it off to delivery. So who delivers the message is going to be the motor neuron. The motor neuron is going to be the effector. That's what we call it. An effector is the muscle, the gland, or even an organ. That's the effector. So the motor neuron is gonna cause the effector an effect. So this motor neuron is going to affect the muscle and eventually cause contraction, okay? So that's what you see here. So if you get asked this question, what is this? That's an axon terminal, if you can see that right there. This is a dendrite, and that's an axon terminal. So the dendrite is receiving the information from the axon terminal and the axon right here from another neuron, okay? So if we have it here on a sticker, you can see that um, basically what you are looking at is just a separate um, axon terminal. All right, so for the purposes of this practical, you should know the nodes of Ranvier, the myelin sheath, the axon, there's the axon, the uh, dendrites right here, 
okay and then of course the axon terminals right here and you can see them um, all over the place right here okay so that's that the next thing I'm going to talk about is that uh, the myelin sheath okay which covers that axon and I showed you right here okay the myelin sheath is formed by extensions of very specialized microglial cells in the nervous system. So we have neurons that their only purpose in life is to conduct an impulse, all right? Um, and then there are other uh, specific cells in the nervous system that are supportive. So particularly the supportive cells, uh, one of them is called the myelin sheath uh, formation, created by a particular cell in the CNS, it's called oligodendrocyte. So the oligodendrocyte is a special neuroglial cell that has extensions, and its extensions create this myelin sheath on the axons of the neurons, which fire the uh, nerve impulses, the action potentials traveling down the axon. Now, that's in the CNS. Now, in the PNS, PNS is peripheral nervous system that includes the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves. The cells that will have the extension and create this myelin sheath, those kind of cells are called Schwann cells. So make sure you have the distinct delineation between the CNS and the PNS. The CNS consists of the brain and spinal cord and the oligodendrocytes form the myelin sheath. In the PNS, the myelin sheath is formed by the Schwann cells, okay? All right, now, the last portion of my video, I am not high tech here, so I'm gonna turn the video to show you the slide that has the picture, the drawing of the uh, neuromuscular junction, and there it is. Okay, so the neuromuscular junction, I'm going to be right here so you can hear me, is where the beginning of muscle contraction occurs. So pointing over here, this is the myelin sheath. Now, if you can imagine that as the uh, action potential travels down the axon, via saltatory conduction hopping along the nodes of Ranvier, you cannot see it here, this is just the end result, it finally reaches the axon terminal, which is seen here. This whole structure is called the axon terminal. All right, so now I'm going to explain to you the three phases of muscle contraction. So phase one is events at the neuromuscular junction. Step one, a action potential travels down the axon Moving along the nodes of Ranvier via depolarization, those ion channels with the sodium diffusing into the membrane of the axon, and then eventually potassium coming out, three to two ratio, those ion channels change the voltage from a resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts to a threshold value of negative 55 and eventually reaching positive 40, which is the peak of the action potential. Anyway, that whole event is very quick, and it's basically the motor neuron getting activated by receiving a message from an interneuron or other neurons to fire. So the action potential travels down the axon and reaches the axon terminal. That is step one. So if you wanted to describe, let's say, um, in an essay, which is one of your assignments, step one for the events at the neuromuscular junction is that the action potential travels down the axon via saltatory conduction along the nodes of Rambier to reach the axon terminal. Now what? Well, once the action potential reaches the axon terminal, there are uh, calcium channels along the axon terminal that are going to open because they're voltage-gated calcium channels. What does voltage-gated mean? It means that the change in voltage occurred because of that action potential. So step two is calcium channels open due to the change in voltage and calcium is released into 
the axon terminal. All right, so that's step two is calcium channels open and calcium is released into the axon terminal. Step three, because of the calcium rushing into the axon terminal, these synaptic vesicles seen here in green containing what's written out there, ACH. ACH stands for the neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is released from the synaptic vesicles via exocytosis. Okay, so that's the next step. Then what happens? Well, the acetylcholine has to travel across this synaptic cleft. There is a gap here between the neuron side, the axon terminal, and the motor end plate. So this whole area here that infolds, this is the motor end plate. The motor end plate is a smaller section of the entire muscle fiber, which is considered a muscle cell. The sarcolemma is considered the equivalent of the cell membrane. The sarcolemma is the infolding, and this infolding here has acetylcholine receptors. So ready, willing, and waiting for the neurotransmitter acetylcholine to cross the synaptic cleft. Well, guess what? Once the acetylcholine reaches the acetylcholine receptor, you bet what's going to happen is the acetylcholine <coughs> binds to the acetylcholine receptor and of course just like a domino effect the acetylcholine receptor has a channel channel opens and guess what happens next is sodium rushes in potassium leaves and again there's a change in the membrane potential here as well so that the uh, whole motor end plate becomes less negative so we've got an action potential now traveling across the motor end plate across the sarcolemma, and then eventually we're going to reach the T-tubules, all right? So now we get to phase two. Phase two is the excitation contraction coupling. All right, so give me a second because I want to go to the one slide that's going to show you uh, the T-tubules. Give me one second, I'm going to move over. Okay, I'm back. So these are the T-tubules. The T-tubules seen here in purple. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a transport system. The ends of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, these ends are called terminal cisternae. Two terminal cisternae and one T-tubule makes the triad. This is where it's all happening. Now remember what I said, that um, once we have a depolarization occurring across the motor end plate uh, with the sodium rushing in, potassium leaving that three to two ratio. Um, that is the actual action potential. So now let's discuss with the help of this uh, picture right here, uh, phase two. So phase two of muscle contraction is excitation contraction coupling. So excitation contraction coupling occurs when the action potential travels down the T-tubule and along the T-tubule are voltage-gated uh, proteins. And these proteins are uh, kind of hanging around, residing around that triad, okay? They change shape once the action potential reaches these proteins. The proteins change shape and the channel in the protein opens and guess what? A flood of calcium is released into the sarcoplasmic reticulum seen here looks like a spider's web. At this point, you can see here the myofilaments. This is already at the molecular level, all right? And these myofilaments are the thick filament and the thin filament. And the thick and the thin filament uh, come together and contract from a Z to Z. So what's a Z to Z? One Z band to another Okay, we call it Z-disc here. One Z-disc to another Z-disc is a sarcomere unit of contraction. So the thick and the thin actually come closer together. So I'm going to go back to showing you. The thick and the thin kind of get like this closer together. I'm going to move away from the light. And that is the contraction phase. So we discussed already the excitation contraction coupling.
The steps to that was that, as I mentioned before, the action potential that occurred from events at the neuromuscular junction is now traveling down the T-tubule and causing those voltage-gated uh, proteins to change shape. When the protein changes shape, it opens the channel and then calcium rushes in. That's all that happens um, during excitation contraction coupling. Now, this next model shows you what I'm talking about. If you look really, really close, I'm gonna move a little bit closer to the video uh, camera right here. You can see the uh, darkened uh, bands there. That's a unit of contraction is a sarcomere. And what you see here um, over it, this is one muscle fiber with the myofibrils, the thick and the thin filament, okay? Right here, you can see the axon terminal and the motor end plate. Okay, there's the axon terminal. And right here, you can see the uh, myelin sheath. And right here, you can see the node of Ranvier, the gap. So remember, saltatory conduction, the action potential hops along saltatory conduction from the um, node of Ranvier and then eventually reaches the axon terminal. And you can see here the uh, motor end plate right there. Okay? All right, so the final phase is when all that calcium has rushed into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, uh, we reach that third phase, which is the cross bridge cycle. The cross bridge cycle is the thick and the thin filaments coming together. So the cross bridge cycle begins like this. The calcium that was released in the sarcoplasmic reticulum is now going to bind to troponin on the thick filament. The thick filament then changes shape and turns, exposing the actin molecule on the thin filament to the thick filament uh, with the myosin head. All right, so let me repeat that one more time. So from excitation contraction coupling, all the steps that occurred there with the protein changing shape and the channel opening and the calcium releasing in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. We move on to phase three, which as I mentioned is the cross bridge cycle. In order for that to even begin, the calcium must attach to the troponin molecule on the thin filament. It changes shape, thereby exposing the other molecule on the thin filament called the actin molecule. So the actin is now exposed to the myosin head on the thick filament. The myosin head on the thick filament has to uh, get into the uh, normal position ready to uh, create that whole um, contraction. So what happens is the uh, myosin head moves into the cocked position and an ATP is used, energy is used to um, initiate that event. Now, the cross bridge attachment where the actin and the myosin actually connect, make contact, another ATP is used. That's when the actin and the myosin head make contact, ATP is used. Next step is the power stroke. So the power stroke is finally the actual contraction of the sarcomeres getting shorter because the thick and the thin filaments interact and pivot. So the myosin head pivots and causes a shortening in the sarcomere. So the myosin head pivots on the actin and of course another ATP is used. All right, so that's the cross bridge power stroke actually causing uh, the contraction. Well, what happens after that? We can't continue to contract. So at that point, we have detachment. So in order for the myosin head to detach from the actin molecule, another ATP is used. And then finally, what happens is that the myosin head returns to its normal cocked position. At that point, uh, we've got to have that calcium go back to where it belongs, back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and everything goes back to normal. All right, so that is quite a lot of information that we uh, threw at you this week. Uh, everything from the anatomy of a neuron and understanding what a motor neuron does, understanding the structure of a neuron uh, to review. You've got the dendrites that receive the information, axon, away, A, away, axon sends the message away. How, via nerve impulse, how does that happen? Well, it's an electrochemical event. 
Basically, it's the electrolytes moving in and out along the membrane, along those ion channels, the sodium and the potassium. When the sodium rushes in, that causes that membrane change from a negative 70 millivolts to a 55, that threshold. It's all or nothing. It's going to happen once it reaches the threshold. Then the action potential travels along the axon to the axon terminal. That change in voltage also alerts the calcium channels at the axon terminal. Calcium channels open and calcium rushes in. Rushes in and at the axon terminal, once the calcium channel is open and the calcium rushes in, the synaptic vesicles, what do you think happens? Poof, it opens via exocytosis and releases the acetylcholine, which then travels across the synaptic cleft, which then travels and reaches the postsynaptic side, which is the motor end plate, in this case, a skeletal muscle fiber. One muscle fiber is one cell. And now at the motor end plate, we've got these receptors ready and willing to react. So what's happening? It's a lock and a key. Um, obviously, the key is the neurotransmitter. The lock is the acetylcholine receptor. It matches. It opens. So the channel opens, and then sodium rushes in. Potassium leaves, changing that whole membrane potential. And the action potential continues to travel along the motor end plate, along the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber, and down the T-tubule, at which point something else happens, excitation contraction coupling. What happens is the protein changes shape, and again, like we said before, boom, the uh, channel opens and a rush of uh, calcium goes into that sarcoplasmic reticulum. In the sarcoplasmic reticulum, we've got all this calcium and eventually finds its way to the myofilaments. Which one? The thin filament, right? Because we've got the thin filament with the troponin and the actin, and we got the thick filament with the myosin head. Those are the myofilaments that are the um, structures, the microscopic structures. It's molecular structure of that muscle fiber, which is the muscle cell. All right, so then the final phase is the cross bridge cycle, which I did before. I described it to you, but I'm just going to reiterate it. So obviously, uh, calcium binds to troponin, and then the actin changes shape, exposing the actin. Um, I'm sorry, let me repeat that again because I'm getting ahead of myself. Troponin binds to the thin filament, changing shape of the thin filament, thereby exposing the actin to the myosin head. So the myosin head on the thick filament has to prep itself now and moves into the cocked position and ATP is used. The myosin head attaches to the actin, now the ATP is used. The myosin head pivots, that's the power stroke, now the ATP is used, that's the contraction phase of the sarcomeres. And then detachment, the myosin head detaches from the actin, now the ATP is used. And then finally, the myosin head goes back into its original cocked position. And that is everything I could tell you about muscle contraction. See you in lab. Enjoy this class. It's a lot of fun. It's hard. It's challenging. But once you know it, it's absolutely phenomenal. Can you believe that all this happens in your body? It's amazing. That's why I love teaching anatomy. Take care. Have a good night.